Welcome to the Swim Swam podcast. I'm your host, Coleman Hodges, and joining me today, we've got a very special guest. He is a three-time world champion. He's a two-time Olympian for Great Britain. Uh, he held the world record in the 50-meter backstroke for nine years and two days until just over two years ago. Uh, please welcome Liam Tancock. Liam, how's it going, man? Awesome, yeah. Thank you very much, Coleman, for the introduction. Very nice. Absolutely. I, I, I tried to do a little homework. Uh, I, st I studied up on you as best I could. Um, so let's let's get started with the here and now. I want to know, uh, I'm, I'm assuming you've been you've been watching the ISL just a little bit. Do you think that you could jump in a pool right now and do the 50 meter backstroke skins? I could do it. I wouldn't I wouldn't be very fast. <laughs> No, I, I love the water and it's, um, you know, it's a great opportunity for those guys to, to get in and race. But no, I, I certainly wouldn't be competitive. I, I, um, I enjoy the experience and that's all it is. It's not about times anymore or positions for me. It is for those guys. Yeah, absolutely. Are you, are, do you, are you still swimming? Do you still stay in the pool at all? Uh, well, because of the current restrictions, it's been very difficult. So obviously the elite guys are back training and but not all the not all the pools in the country are even open. So, you know, in the UK, we're probably expected to lose um, maybe 25 percent of pools. So 25 percent of pools in the UK will, will potentially never open. So um, just because of the cost and the, and the current climate, um, lots have been mothballed. Um, but yeah, it's, it's, um, it's, it's obviously been a very devastating time for, uh, for the world of, well, water sports, really. Um, and uh, anyone who, who loves the water as much as, as, as us, yeah, it's been tough, tough. So no, I haven't been in the pool for, for a long time, but I, you know, there's nothing better than diving into the water. So as soon as I can, I'll be there. That's, I mean, it's good to hear you, you, you I feel like you encounter a lot of elite athletes who just did it for so long and they grind it and they grind it. And then when they were done, they're like, all right, I'm never getting in a pool again. And, uh, it's, it, you know, that's kind of a, that's sad for me to hear because I like swimming so much. And, uh, it's, it's good to hear that, that you're still in tune with the water and still have a love for it. Certainly. Oh, exactly. And it, it, it is tough. And as you say, I know lots of people and I was probably one of those guys that needed a bit of time out of the water. Um, but I think, it, it never really leaves you. It never really leaves you that, that feeling. And I think actually the best moment for me is actually that diving. When you first dive into the water, you feel the water, you glide, and it's that experience. It's, it's like nothing else. You're almost in your own bubble. So um, I remember I used to do it leading into a major competition. Basically, as soon as I've shaved down, my first thing, first thing I would have done would be a dive and glide. And um, maybe it's come from that, but it was, uh, yeah, always special. That, ah, uh, man, the, the feeling of getting in the, the, your first time in the water after a clean shave, there is nothing like that, but that, that's a, that's a really cool, uh, you know, ceremony or ritual that you would do it just to dive and glide after you shave. Did you, uh, have like, did you know where your furthest one was? Did you, did you count the, the number of crosses or T's you would cross after each dive and glide? It was one of those, I, I talk about a, the feel a lot when I when I talk about swimming and my swimming especially and obviously every pool slightly different some have tiles some don't um so for me it was the feel that I got when I dived into the water I knew how I was going to swim that meet you know whether it's the Olympic game world championship Commonwealth games I knew how I was going to swim based off a of dive and glide all right uh that's fascinating tell me tell me about that you know you're you're I get you're a guy who's into feel. Um, what was a good dive and glide like versus a, a not so good dive and glide? It wasn't really about the distance, although obviously the distance definitely mattered. Um, it was more about the, and, and I did it in my own time, so it wasn't even off a, a, a take your marks a go. It was more my body telling me, right, I'm ready to go. I want to feel this. I want to, um, 
I want to feel every part of this. And obviously your, your senses are heightened because you've just shaved down. So yeah, I'd explode off the block and it was from obviously a block. It wasn't a backstroke start. It was actually off the block. Um, no kicks at all, straight into a full streamline, really holding it as tight as possible. And every part of that I was really in tune with. So um, I knew if my little toe was sticking out a little bit, it was very much like honing that skill to, um, to be the best I could be. And it was all about the feeling. So yes, the distance mattered. And, you know, I, I can't even remember what my best was now, but it was, um, it was all really about the feel. And I knew from that moment that, you know, I'd come up with a smile on my face and my coach would probably be, you know, give me a thumbs up. They could probably tell by then as well. It was always yeah. really. That's, that's fascinating. I've never heard, I've never heard that, but that's, that's a really, Again, that's a that's a really cool ritual. Um, do you do you remember a specific meet where you, you dive and glided, and then you were like, all right, like what was the best dive and glide you ever had at an, at a big international meet? Do you know the first ever dive and glide I ever did was back when I was swimming for Exeter, my first ever swimming club, my first ever shaved down, and I went to put a pool boy in and, and start my warm up, and my coach was like, I'm going to stop you and pull me back and sort of explain the situation. It was like, look, you've never felt a shave down before. Like, use this moment to to feel it. And I was like, I don't know what you mean. And it was like, just dive in and feel it. You don't have to do anything, just feel the water. And I remember that. And then after that moment, I did it all the time. It was incredible. So um, that was probably my, my favourite. But all the way through, and, I, you know, the last major competition competition I did was um, the World Championships in Kazan in 2015. So, um, you know, and I did it there in the warm-up pool. It didn't even need to be in the main pool. It was in the warm-up pool behind. Um, and it was, yeah, it was pretty cool. It was really cool. But I did it every major meet I went to, every pool I went to. To be fair, even if I was in a training camp and it was a new pool, I did quite like that you get to know a lot about a pool by just diving in. So, um, yeah, maybe that's a bit strange, but this is a conversation between swimmers that only swimmers would understand. Right. Exactly. <laughs> I, I love where your head's at. Uh, and, and speaking of things only swimmers would understand, you know, you said the diving glide helped you understand each pool. And I, and I recently talked to a couple of different swimmers about, um, comparing international experiences and they're like, it's so hard because every set of circumstances you go to, you know, whether it's Kazan, whether it's London, whether it's, uh, Budapest, whether, you know, it's in the U S it's in Asia, it's, it's every pool so different, every set of circumstances surrounding a world champs, a Commonwealth games and Olympic games is so different. Do you have, do you have a favorite pool to compete at one that, that, specific pool really stood out to you is like yeah this yeah I, I can do a good dive and glide and i'm going to swim fast here um from a home pool perspective sheffield ponds ford was pretty incredible um you know it's i think it held a world cup back in the day and there's lots of world records being broken there um mm -hmm. but it was sort of a staple for us being in the midlands and it actually nearly closed down we actually petitioned and got it to uh got some money to reopen it recently and it's it's due to open i think next week which is really exciting so that would have been a pool that would have been a really shame to lose um obviously london london olympic pool um you know an incredible facility i actually really liked when i went over to melbourne um both for the commonwealth games and for the world championship so 06 and 07 both different pools but it was it was really um it was a cool environment with the the different setups over there um, obviously one was inside the Rod Laver tennis arena. Um, and, uh, the other one was in the, 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 the normal pool there in, in Melbourne. Um, every pool's got its quirks. Every pool's got its, you know, um, different things that make it special. Actually just talking about Melbourne, the Melbourne pool inside the Rod Laver arena, incredible. Some amazing tennis players have, you know, um, done the Aussie open there, which is, you know, for us to swim in it, it was really good. They did the same in the UK in the Manchester um, MEN Arena. Um, they did that for the World Short Course Championships in 2008. But I remember in uh, in Melbourne, it was the first time they truly used the fire and the you know the the, the cool stuff going on outside of the pool, which meant 
the pool was was even uh, sorry the experience in the pool was even better. The thing that I didn't like is that the pool was obviously deck level, but to go anywhere you had to go down some stairs. So after racing the the hundred backstroke final, um, trying to walk down the stairs with the other eight guys in the um, uh, in the final was uh, yeah a bit of a killer on the legs. <laughs> But, and again, yeah, just speaks to every, every pool is different. Every pool's got its, its quirks and whatnot. That sounds like a cool experience, but yeah, the stairs after a race doesn't sound ideal for sure. Oh, good. Down. Down. Going up would be okay. It's going down. It was steep. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's, that's no good. Um, <clears throat> so you mentioned we're, we're jumping all over the place, but you mentioned the 2012 London Olympics and, um, you know, obviously that that was a home Olympics for you. Um, what, I mean, tell me about the, the mentality going in of, wow, I'm going to compete at an Olympics on, on home soil for me. Truly incredible. Obviously my first, well, my first, uh, Olympic games experience was over in Beijing in 2008 and China put on a great show. It was, uh, it was an incredible experience. Um, and I probably didn't truly know what the London Olympics was going to be like until I'd competed at an Olympics. So, um, you know, that was special, but actually the, the excitement and the buzz around the Olympics just sort of grew and grew and grew. And it wasn't probably until the last couple of months leading into the, into the games that, you know, the whole of the UK changed tact and it was rather than, you know, this is going to grind London to a halt. Everyone got behind it. The games makers made that experience. Um, and it was, it was truly incredible. And I feel pretty lucky and privileged to, to, have, to have basically been good enough to compete at home Olympic Games. Everything's got to fit at the right time. So not many people go to the Olympic Games full stop. But actually to have one that actually fits within a time where you're at your peak and it's a home games, that's, you know, that's a very small minority of people. So it's, um, yeah, it's super, super special to, to almost reminisce and think about that. You know, I've heard the, the Aussies talking about how amazing Sydney was 20 years ago and, you know, how crazy it is. It's been 20, 20 years since the Sydney 2000 Olympics, but it, it means so much to, to that, to that individual who competed at a, a home games. It is, it is different than, than any other. Yeah, I mean, it's it seems like it would be a, a truly special and, and memorable experience. Do you have um, a favorite memory from that games, <clears throat> whether it was in the pool, out of the pool? I mean, what what stands out to you about that experience once you were actually, you know, submerged in it? Um, I think the biggest memory is is the crowd, and. You know, I hear sports people, sports fans, you know, rugby, football, NFL, whoever it might be, whatever sport it might be, they always talk about the home crowd advantage. Mm -hmm. And I never really understood it. You know, I, I had a cousin that played in the premiership for, the, for football and, you know, he talked about it all the time. And I just never really understood it until I walked out in the final for the 100 backstroke in London. That was the only time I've really ever properly felt it obviously in the lead up rounds was, was amazing, but mm -hmm. in the final walking out and there's 17 and thousand people in the stadium cheering for me, it was literally, they were chanting my name and I was just like, this doesn't happen in swimming. So, and it was the only time I've ever heard, heard the crowd when I'm actually swimming as well. So, you know, turn on the turn, I could hear the crowd cheering. So it was, for me, it was again, the feeling I talk about feeling a lot. It was the feeling of that experience was what truly made it special for me. And we couldn't, as Brits, we couldn't go anywhere with our kit on. And, you know, it, it was crazy. It was absolutely crazy. <laughs> I, I mean, I got chills just, just listening to that story. Um, I mean, that I, I can't imagine, yeah, 17,000 people just, just, just cheering um, for you, nonetheless. It, it sounds, yeah. Uh, I mean, that sounds so cool. And so your, uh, your national teammate, James Gibson, who's now one of the coaches for ISL, um, he was, he was, you swam with him. He was your coach for a while. Tell me about that relationship 
um, how you guys became first peers and then as a, as a coach athlete. Um, so James, um, 50 breaststroke world champion, became world, world champion in 2003. Um, he trained in Loughborough, Loughborough University at the program there under uh, coach Ben Titley. And I moved to university in 2003. So the end of 2003, I moved up to Loughborough from, from Exeter. So um, from the Southwest into the Midlands and, and basically joined the group, joined the team. Um, and, you know, we're surrounded by great athletes, a great coach and, you know, learning from all these people, you know, James was a, a, a fresh new world champion. Obviously he did the hundred as well. I think he came second in the hundred, won the 50 and, you know, there's some real good pedigree amongst the group. And I was the, you know, young gun, the new kid coming through. Um, and then obviously we went on training camps and, and such like. So we had a close relationship as our team. Um, and then I guess my first senior team, um, I was I was just roommates with James. So we, we became roommates. So every major meet we went to, we pretty much were, well, we were roommates, which was great. So um knew everything about each other and it was the it was the uh, you know a, a great relationship and um obviously he retired went over to Marseille started coaching and um you know he's a, obviously head head coach of the energy standard ISL team so he's doing a, a fantastic job but I learned a lot from um from from training but also um when he came back from Marseille and actually um went on to coach me so he actually coached almost the group although the group was totally different he coached the same group and I was pretty much the only one left, uh, left there. So it was, it, it was really nice actually. So my, so we were all coached by, um, Ben Titley, who's over in Canada and Toronto with the, the national team over there. And it was when Ben retired or not left the, the national center to take the role over in Canada is when James came back from Marseille to take over the, that role. So it was almost, Everyone knew each other very well, so it was almost a very good relationship. And, you know, lots of people said this to me. It's like, you know, he's, he's a good mate. You, you know him super well. Um, you know, you've lived together. We, we lived in the same block. Do you know what I mean? We trained together. We, we, um, how does that work on a, on a coach-athlete relationship? Um, and it did. It just worked. I think we're both, we were both older athletes or older I, I was an older athlete um, and yeah, we, we both had the, the respect as a, an athlete and as a coach and we took that on board. And, you know, when we walked onto poolside, it was, you know, an athlete coach relationship, but we could still have our, you know, our friendship both inside and outside the pool, which was really special. Yeah. I mean, that's, I, I don't know if I've ever heard of a, an elite athlete, you know, you, you were uh... I mean, you medaled in the 50 backstroke at four straight world championships. You've got a, you've got a high pedigree and someone of that level being coached by their, someone who's so close in age to them as you know, a peer and uh, a former, a former uh, athlete. Uh, but that, that is really cool. So, I mean, what did you pick up from James once he came back to Loughborough and, and you really started working with him? Going back to your previous question, I think it's all about respect. I think if you respect the athlete, you respect the coach, you respect the person. And, you know, I'm there to do my best. He was there to do his best. We all want the same common goal. So it was it was relatively easy. Just because we were mates, it almost made it easier. So, um, yeah, for, from that perspective, it, it wasn't even a thing. It just it just sort of happened. Like, um yeah. And I think for, for me, what, what James brought back into the program is, um, you know, we always had quite individualized programs anyway with Ben. He, he was a, an unbelievable session writer. You know, I was coached by Ben for 10 years and I don't think we did the same session twice. It was incredible. Um, yeah. but we were all very in, in individualized, even within the same group. We, you know, we were doing different sessions that all fit around the same principles, but to get the best out of every individual. But I was coming, when I was with James, I was uh, an older athlete. I was coming more to the end of my career. I'd, I'd been to the, the, you know, two Olympic Games. I still had more left in me, whether it's Commonwealth Games and, and World Championships. But it was more learning how to deal with an older athlete. So he was an older athlete. He trained with older athletes. He, 
he took all his knowledge on board and actually um, shared that with me. And it was like, well, how can we get the best out of you today? And I think the, the biggest thing I learned is that the older I got, the more I struggled to recover. So I could do one thing very well, but actually the recovery took longer. So if I had a good session, you know, when I was 18, I could back him up, back him up, back him up. But as I got older, I had a good session and hit a, hit a real good energy system. You know, I would need to recover from that and it might take me longer. And that's probably ultimately what ended my career because I couldn't back up the heats, the semi and the final. If I went all out, my that's what affected me at, at the end. It was just the recovery rate between was was really difficult. So to to learn that and take take some um some really valuable lessons and information from James was was obviously fantastic but also he um he sort of looked at it in a slightly different way obviously as a former athlete but working with different coaches in different countries you're going to pick up different ideas and um you know I was always known for my speed my speed going out um but actually working with James I had I had a decent front end, but I had the best back end I ever did. And I was doing less meters and I was older. So I took lots from that. That's interesting. So you had the best back end of your career later in your career, uh, doing less meters. How, how, why, why, I mean, why do you think that was? Uh, consistency, I think. Um, and I was one of those guys that could do something really well. Like if it was lifting a weight, I could lift a heavy weight, but I wasn't, you know, I, I could never repeat them that often. So um, for me, it was, it was like, well, how can we, how can we look your, take your body type, take your, the way your body reacts to um, exercise and make it better. So, you know, for, for me, it was, it was almost as simple as backing off the front end. My, my easy speed was as quick as my speed. So if it was easier to do it, I had more energy to come back. So, um, you know, more consistent on the stroke rate rather than starting at 60 and ending on 50, you know, if I kept a consistent stroke rate of 55, the whole way, an average of a more, well, I'd actually be better for it. So, um yeah so we just looked at looked at the same picture in a different way yeah i mean that seem it seems smart i think you see you hear about a lot of people making changes like that and it, it seems you know obviously you had success with it and that's that's really cool uh and so you you mentioned you were known for your front end speed. You mentioned you can lift heavy things. T tell me about how your training changed maybe outside the pool as you got older and matured through the sport. Um, I, I was, I always looked at, I, I was always lucky enough to be in a group where we looked at things differently rather than looking at what happened in the past, which we did. We looked at, you know, what people have done for, you know, hundreds of years and why the best people are the best people. We sort of took that to another level and said, well, yes, these were the best athletes over the last hundred years in the pool. We can learn a lot from them, but actually if we truly broke down our event, you know, if we truly broke down swimming, we can take different things out of it. So, you know, I'll give you an example. We all, we all start the race. And it's an explosive action of jumping, whether it's on the block or off the pad, is swimmers, there's a few that do, and there are great, but they're not known for jumping. They're known for swimming. So if we looked at different sports that were actually known for jumping, say basketball, long jump, triple jump, and actually spoke to them, which they specifically train for that one element, and broke it down, so broke the stroke of backstroke or the start or different key parts of a race down into key elements and took took a little bit from everyone. You know, athletics, they've started on track start for hundreds of years. Swimming, it's not been that long. It's since Beijing or something. So, you know, it's not been that long. So we can learn more from them because they've been used in a track start for longer. So we sort of thought outside the box. Um, and that's where lots of different cross training came in for me 
it was like who's good at something why are they good and how does that directly relate back to me in the pool and how can that make me faster so you know we looked at kickboxing we looked at ballet we looked at rock climbing we looked at all sorts um and people are always like, well, that's, you know, that's crazy. Why did you do, ballet always gets everyone. Why, why do you, why did you do ballet? And I wouldn't say I did ballet in, in the normal sense, but I, you know, if we looked at a ballet dancer, male or female, it doesn't matter. They've got a super strong core and they're hyper aware of their body position, their hand placement, their toe position. As a swimmer, a good swimmer needs to have a super strong core, body aware, and hand and feet placement it's just it just coincides so if we can learn to have that outside the pool we can take that in the water and and directly relate it same with kickboxing kickboxing they're like why do you do kickboxing but actually for me for backstroke is people talk about the arms and the legs in swimming but actually the hips and the core are super super important so you know we we learned with a, a uh, you know a black belt kickboxer who who taught us how to use our hips more powerfully on land so then we could relate that into our kick or underwater um in, in backstroke which was which was really interesting to understand and you know you talk about boxes if they're throwing a punch and they're flat it's not got much power but if you swing into it if you move your hips and you create that power from somewhere else you you become better and you you move more or you create more power or whatever it might be so we basically tried to cherry pick or look at the stroke break it down and cherry pick the best athletes around the world who were really good at it and then try and pull it all back together so I didn't do it through through the whole season and you know as I say when I was kickboxing we did a bit of sparring but it wasn't really about that it was trying to create the power and teach the body to to use the body in a more effective way I think that's brilliant. <laughs> Everything you just said makes so much sense to me from, from like a coaching perspective and from an athlete learning perspective. Um, <clears throat> I mean, I think we see more people trying to think outside the box now, but I, I like that makes so much sense of like, okay, well we can transition this here and this is how the best do it. Yeah. yeah. <clears throat> it's brilliant. Uh, but I think if you give ownership back to the athlete and almost enable them to um, to find their rhythm, to find their way and, and to understand their body and all, you know, you can push them in the right direction, but ask them to think outside the box, not just telling them, I think that helps. And I think that's what, you know, Ben Telly or, J or James Gibson really taught me as well. It's, it's not just here on a plate. It's like, you know, let's, let's all think together and all our minds together are better than one. And we can bring that to the table, which is, which was always really good. And that's what Loughborough really helped with. Loughborough University was uh, an enabler of that. You know, Ian Armadura, the, you know, the helm of the programme, really supported that thinking. You know, he, was, he really supported that thinking that, and that network through Ben and, you know, mentoring Ben and, and vice versa with James, uh, you know, as a coach and an athlete. And I think that really helps. If you surround yourself by the right people, good things can happen. Yeah. It, I mean, it sounds like it. And, and you obviously had a lot of success and were able to have a very long career. Um, I mean, you, you, you swam well into 30. I, is that correct? Yep. Um, so, you know, through, through all of these different um, cross training methods on dry land, was there ever one um, or one season where you, where you thought it really hit and really translated into the water for you not particularly no it wasn't there wasn't one key moment there wasn't one key year one key element it was more a um a combination of consistency and i think that's the key you know i think there's a, a bruce lee quote out there where he says i'm not afraid of of someone that's practiced uh, um 10, kick one time it's the people that's practice one kick 10,000 times. They're the people you need to worry about. So if we can create a, a consistent, almost like a culture within, within the support, within the sport, it's, that's what I think helped me. 
um, you know, I say I moved to Loughborough University in 2003 and, you know, I ended my career there and it was a, a fantastic experience that enabled me to, you know, I had all the facilities, I had all the coaching, the support network to enable me to, um, to be consistent. And I think that's um, definitely a big, a big key for me. Yeah. I mean, that's uh, starting your, yeah, your international career in 2003 and ending it, you know, 12, 13 years later in the same place really speaks volumes of, yeah, this, this place must have had, must have done something right for sure. Um, so, okay. To, to wrap things up, um, just, just a couple of fun questions. Do you have a favorite race or a race that sticks out to you, um, as, as being, you know, as being a good one? Um, not really. I think, I think for me, um, I just love racing. It wouldn't matter where it was, when it was, if I was ready to race, I just love that element of racing. So I think, I think there's a couple things there's, you know, I always wanted to, I always wanted to break the world record. Um, and I broke the world record for the first time in 2008 in Pond Forge in Sheffield. Um, I beat it uh, from a German, Thomas Ripraff. And, you know, the next time I saw him, he shook me hand and said, well done, which was, you know, a really nice, respectful thing to do. And within a few months, Randall Bow from America broke the, broke the world record. And it wasn't until the following summer over in Rome at the World Championships where I broke it back in, in the semi-final and then broke it again in the final. And I think for me, um, regardless of the, the, the timing or anything, that pool over there is incredible in, uh, in Rome, the outdoor pool. And I wish we did more outdoor meets because, you know, I, I loved it even as a backstroker. But to stand on the podium um, and listening to the national anthem, having won a gold in a world record time was was pretty cool. So for me, it was more about the experience of racing, but in terms of a moment, um, yeah, that was pretty special. And to, to repeat that two years later, um, you know, standing on the podium in in Shanghai in 2011, having won the um, won the gold again was, yeah, was awesome. I mean, it, again, you you 2005 you won bronze in a 50 back at world champs 2007 you repeat as bronze and then you know you were 2009 you were able to win gold and then 11 able to repeat as gold um four medals and four you know in the same event at a world champ four consecutive world championships that's again to me that's that's pretty amazing oh, and appreciate a pretty big accomplishment it is cool to look at it. And I think that, I guess that shows consistency. And that's what I've always looked up to with people in, in different sports. It's not people that sort of gone there and done it once. It's people that's stayed around and been consistent. And if you look back in, you know, my first world championships, when, when I did get the, the bronze medal in Montreal in 2005, I think I was seven one hundredths behind the gold. So it wasn't as if it was a great distance anyway, even when I, you know, you know, that swimming, right. So, um, no, it's, it's, it's an amazing, it's, it's been amazing. And I probably only truly look back on my career once I'd finished, um, you know, so your introduction, it's always nice to hear, but I, I tend not to hear it. I didn't hear it when I swam and it's only when I do things like this and in interviews that, you know, people bring it up. Wow. That's yeah, that, that is, that is pretty cool. <laughs> um, so, so uh, to, to wrap things up, bring it full circle. What do you do now? Um, you know, tell tell me about your day to day, and and obviously it's been it's been a weird seven months for the whole world. But um, yeah, what, what you know, how, what are you doing now, and and are you able to connect with the swimming community still? Yeah, definitely. So I'm I'm still heavily involved in swimming. I I absolutely love it. Um, from a from a day to day perspective, um, once I retired from the sport of swimming, I didn't want to I didn't want to leave. Um, and I wanted to sort of try and give back in a, in a slightly different way. And, and actually looking at, looking at swimming, we've talked a lot about it obviously now, is that I was classed as a good swimmer, not because it was just me, but the team around you, whether it was Loughborough, my coaches, the sports staff. And I, I noted that in my mind. And 
I tried to plan what I wanted to do after sport, but I really took that on board that I wasn't just a good athlete. You know, Lewis Hamilton, world champion Formula One driver. If he didn't have the mechanics around him, his team of, you know, 100 or 200 people, he wouldn't be as fast in the car. So I took that into the world of business. So, um, you know, I was looking to set up a, a, a brand um, for the world of swimming. And I didn't really know anything about setting up a brand. I didn't really understand that side of things. I'd, I'd learned a lot. I've worked with some, some really big brands, but I needed a team around me that did. Um, so we created this team, people that have been in the business in, you know, whether that's design or industries, um, in fashion, whatever it might be, finance. And we created a team and created a new uh, swimming brand called Swimsy, but really focusing on the apparel side, so the clothing. Um, and there was a number of reasons for that. And it's, I guess the main thing is there's good brands out there that do things very well, you know, and why would we go up against them? We want to make swimming bigger and more, uh, just a, a more well-rounded um, approach. But then I looked at me as an athlete and, you know, I'd go to the Olympic Games and my event was less than a minute long. You know, if I did heat semi and final, I'd be there for three, three minutes of racing. If I did the the, um, the relays, an extra couple of minutes. So five minutes of racing and I'm there for a month. So yeah. actually, what was my identity? My identity, you know, I was always known as Lee in the swimmer, but inside the pool. Everyone knew I was a swimmer, but outside the pool, how could people understand? So we were like, maybe we can create a brand that, showed I was a swimmer that was cool to non-swimmers but showed I was a swimmer so that's where Swimsy was born um and we also try to do some some slightly different things so one of the one of the big things for me is in the UK and I'm sure this is a, glo a global thing and we spoke to enough people is that swimmers don't drink enough whether you're nine-year-olds learning to swim or you're you know a 30 something year old coming out of the out of the sport people don't drink enough. So we created a, a, a bottle. So a bit like this, it's, it's a litre bottle. I think everyone needs a litre bottle. And on the side, we created a best practice session plan. So it's got your dry <laughs> and your warm up, your preset, your main set, your warm down and your stretch. So as you're going for a session, you know how much to drink. So it's almost giving that ownership back to, back to the athletes, back to the young swimmers, rather than a parent or a coach saying, you need to drink more, you need to drink more. It's actually policed by the by the group around them. They're like, oh, we're on the main set. Why is yours still on the, the warm-up? So it's been really cool. So we've been trying to do different things. And um, that's been really cool. Obviously, it's been a tough time at the moment with um, with the current you know global pandemic going on. Um, but it's I think it's an, an exciting time for um, for me, Swimsy, um, and the swimming community once we get out the end of it. And there's a couple other things that I'm doing. Um, I'm still, you know, heavily involved within British swimming. Um, I'm on the, um, so the British Olympic Association, so Team GB's Athlete Commission. So I'm still involved in in ways like that as well. So um, still firmly on the ground. Um, love being at meets. Love, you know, I was over in um, in Korea last year and absolutely loved it. So um, I'm never too far away from a, a, a swim meet. Uh, I, I have to ask, tell me, tell me about watching in person, the 400 medley, the heart, the, for me, heartbreaking 400 medley relay, uh, where Duncan Scott ran down Nathan Adrian and gave you guys your first ever gold in that event. Pretty special, right? Yeah, it was really cool. The, um, you know, sometimes it just works and it just clicks and those guys had it on that night. You know, I think that's the, the, the good thing about swimming is, you can, if you're all far at the same time, something magical can happen. And um, yeah, yeah, it was, it was pretty special. Uh, well, Liam, before we sign out, do you have any, any parting thoughts uh, for our listeners out there? No, just, just obviously I understand it's a tough time for everyone out there. We will all be back in the water at some point and um, just stay positive and uh, yeah, enjoy life. Well, uh, I appreciate your time. Thank you so much for, for taking a bit to sit down and talk with me. It was great hearing some of your stories. And, you know, obviously you, you've been in the swimming for a long time and you have a lot of knowledge and 
I appreciate you dropping some nuggets on us. Thank you. Thank you, Coleman. Always, anytime. You've been listening to the Swim Swam podcast. Stay tuned for new episodes every week. You can take Swim Swam podcast on the go by subscribing on your favorite podcast platform. Look for links in the description below and be sure to subscribe to our YouTube channel for more videos as well.